Okay, don't let anyone go anywhere. We, we're um, we're going to follow this up with a panel discussion. And um, right now I'm going to introduce our panelists. I'm really excited to have um, these folks here today. Uh, up first, we have Jennifer Coleman. Um, Jennifer Coleman has a long career as an architect in Cleveland. She runs her own firm now, Jennifer Coleman Creative. And she is the chair of Cleveland's Landmarks Commission. Um, Next to Mark, we've got Chris Alvarado. Chris Alvarado is a senior planner with Cuyahoga County, and he's the president of the board of Bike Cleveland. And um, down at the end is Jason Segedy. Uh, Jason Segedy is the director of AMATS. That's Akron's Metropolitan Planning Organization, um, the organization that distributes federal funds for transportation projects. Jason is also the chair of the Northeast Ohio Sustainable Communities Consortium, and that is a group um, representing 12 counties that's been charged with coming up with a plan for Northeast Ohio for how we can be more efficient, more competitive, and more sustainable. So I'm going to turn it over to these guys. And um, we're going to take questions. Uh, uh, Steve Litt, our moderator, is um, sitting over here. He is an architecture critic with the Plain Dealer, two-time um, best critic in Ohio choice. And uh, we're going to—he's going to field a couple questions to our panelists, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience. Thanks, thanks, Angie, and thanks so much for setting up this event today. And Mark, uh, I have to say, I was uh, really struck by the the passion and the intelligence of uh, your your presentation, the comments that you made today. I'm also struck by the fact that uh, you're a layperson coming at this from outside the the professions of of engineering and planning, and how exciting it is to see uh, someone coming forward as a volunteer uh, to enter into this discussion and to try to. Uh, move the uh, the dialogue in the United States. Uh, I want to say, uh, just to reinforce what Angie said a moment ago, we will break for good questions, B-R-A-K-E. So we have, I'm sorry, tell us your name again. Carrie, Carrie is here with a microphone. If you have a burning question, uh, just jump in at, at any time. Uh, Mark, you said this is, this is political, so I want to ask a couple of political questions uh, first. Uh, Given your, your analysis, the way you're, you're bringing quanti your quantitative skills to analysis of traffic, have you focused on the federal transportation budget, how it's structured, and it's spe uh, specifically uh, what the Obama administration is proposing for, for 23? Do you have any thoughts on that to, to share with us? Sure. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, so just you have to keep in mind, historically, the transportation budget is very dominated by the road interests, the oil interests. They're, as a political lobbying force, they're, they're very, very significant. Um, there are a bunch of people in Washington, D.C. who um, recognize the, that our transportation policy, this basically we're only building highway sort of attitude, is outmoded, has a lot of problems. And so there, there are good people in D.C. Who are, who are promoting some very intelligent reforms. Um, and in, in fact, in the Senate recently, they have, have passed um, a, a, a pretty good bill that's, that's, that's a solid improvement over what we have now. I wouldn't say it's anything you know, magically good. It's not what I would choose myself. But it's you know, compared to what we've had, it's pretty good. You have a situation in the House where basically the, the Tea Party Republicans are, are dominating the agenda, and they are actually promoting, uh, proposing stripping out all money for anything other than building highways. And it's, it's unfortunate thinking. It's not really going anywhere, but you kind of now have paralysis in Washington because of this, and it seems like you know, kind of status quo is the best that we can hope for in the short term. Um, President Obama, the Obama administration is quite good. Ray LaHood um, is a very good um, transportation commissioner um, or secretary of department of transportation. I mean, he really gets these issues. He's been um, promoting a lot of good ideas, um, but again, their their ability to implement stuff without legislation is somewhat limited. Well, given that that we have a, a paralysis at at the national level, Jason, 
Uh, tell us about uh, your, your efforts to connect uh, the concepts of uh, transportation and land use in, in Akron. I'm giving you a little opportunity for, uh, to, to plug your own work here. So tell us well, what you Thanks, Steve. I was going to say that the fact there were good people in Washington was news to me. But um, I think what Mark said about the transportation policy is really true. It's been oriented so much toward um, roads, and I think when people discuss other modes of transportation, there's this natural pushback that you get where people are very protective of the automobile. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind there's no danger of cars not getting their day in court or people advocating for driving. So one of the things that I do as a director of a metropolitan planning organization is try to create a little bit of balance and pushback against that. Our agency, our agency in Akron still spends 80% plus of our funding on roads in some way, shape, or form. We've funneled most of that funding now to maintenance of roads, which I think is a lot more uh, of an issue. Roads have to be maintained even for bikes or transit to be able to use them. Um, but I think the dialogue has been, as Mark eloquently put in his transportation uh, presentation here, so stilted toward roads and highways uh, one of the things that Steve alluded to that we've done at our agency is we started an initiative back in 2010 called uh, Connecting Communities, and it's on our website, amatsplanning.org. Um, and what it is is really just a philosophical document looking at the relationship between land use planning and transportation planning. And it makes a lot of the same points that Mark made that we are designed in a way physically uh, really in the United States, but specifically we're dealing with uh, Northeast Ohio, Greater Akron, in our analysis where we, we have a self-fulfilling prophecy. We are building residential and commercial areas that are not dense, that are segregated uses. Ipso facto, you have no other choice other than to drive. Um, and, and I encounter that even a lot with comments from elected officials, which I deal with on a, a daily basis, or the public even, where people say, why would you put a bike lane there or a sidewalk? Nobody walks or nobody bikes. And it's like in a lot of cases, well, there's your answer. You know, there is not a safe environment uh, in order to bike or walk in a lot of parts of even, you know, the inner city of Akron. Um, and, and there's a lot of work to be done. But that, that initiative that we've done connecting communities has been a very good conversation starter. It has gotten a lot of traction with not just the city of Akron, but with suburban areas um, throughout Summit and Portage County, which is the geography we cover. Well, I want to talk to the panel about uh, how, how we speed things up here. I think what Mark is bringing to us today is the idea of shifting modes and doing it more rapidly than just an incremental manner. But it's very hard, isn't it, folks, to uh, talk to uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation or uh, other agencies that have control over this transportation funding, even at the at the federal level, when you can quantify uh, that the proportion of people who ride to work in your city is still rather small. Uh, and we were talking bef uh, before uh, the presentation uh, panelists uh, about that, and someone had a figure for that. Could you remind me what? Yeah, Chris? Yeah, it, well, we were able to uh, look at the Census Bureau, and between uh, 2000 and 2010, within the Cleveland metropolitan area, the number of cyclists who, uh, the number of, of, of commuters to work who choose to bike went up 280%. Uh, but, but the percentage was of the total. But the percentage of the total was still, uh, it's, uh, it was 0.8 percent as of 2010. Right. So it's a very rapid increase on a small base. Uh, so what do you say to elected officials, folks, if, if you're trying to uh, uh, change this so you, you add the facilities that, uh, facilities, that's jargon, pardon me, bike lanes, uh, uh, complete streets, uh, that will encourage this this uh, more rapid shift as they're doing in Chicago. How do we do that here? Well, one of the things that we can remind folks is that uh, the national highway system didn't come about because there were cars that were driving across pastures uh, between uh, Columbus and Akron, and they needed a, a highway to to get there. It the highway system induced the demand in in automobiles. Um, and it did, it did a marvelous job of doing that. Uh, you can take that analogy and apply that to uh, uh, 
uh, better uh, protected bike lanes or more sidewalks or more funding for transit. If you, if you devote the funding to the types of movement that you want to see in your communities, people will move toward those, those, uh, uh, those modes. Jennifer, the, the mood in, in Cleveland is changing over the past few years, is it not? I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty pronounced. Uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago, even uh, 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 more recently, we were just talking about big projects, gateway, football stadium, things like that. Now we're all in this room talking about the spaces between the buildings. That's uh, kind of a change. Why is that happening in Cleveland now? I think it's a critical point and uh, maybe a little bit of a perfect storm of things. Back in the 15 years ago, early 90s, when we did have Gateway, there were projects, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, all these big projects, everyone was behind them. We were the comeback city at that point. You know, things basically stalled a little bit because we were designing buildings, we were designing projects, we weren't really designing to change the basic nature of what's happening downtown. Downtown was still basically a nine to five city. The amount of people who lived downtown was negligible in the 1990s, 80s and 90s, really sort of pioneer type folks in the warehouse district. But now, and I think one of the biggest ways you can see that is the mayor appointing the group plan commission, which really looked at not, our, not specifically the medical mart or uh, the casino, but looked at our public spaces. So there was increased eyes on the redevelopment of the mall of hopefully the redevelopment ideas that are coming into play with public square. So those are really addressing livability issues and that's not necessarily living downtown but the ability to get around downtown in a comfortable um, intuitive fashion. And those are the key things like we just talked about and we saw in the presentation that are going to bring people. We have to design for people. So in that time, we've seen uh, some negligible number in the 1990s census increased a little bit to the 2000 census. And, and in 2010, we've got, you know, a, a scope below 10,000 people. Um, as we've known from looking at other cities, the kind of magic number of people to create a, vi a vital 24-7 downtown is about 20,000. So we managed to keep that 10,000 through a very tough recession and downtown is basically growing which bu is bucking the trend of other areas, many areas in, in uh, Cleveland. So I think at this point we have to start looking at, looking forward and I mean all the folks who are down here, not just the younger folks, but look forward to what kind of city do we want at 20,000 at 20, people. Well, so, uh, we got a question? Uh, yes. yes. Um, Please tell us your name. Sure. So Hi, we'll, Kevin Cronin. I, thank you for uh, your comments, and I appreciate that. Um, you were talking earlier about politics and coalitions and things like that, and in your discussion, you talked a lot about congestion, which suggests uh, clean air coalitions, coalitions with those who are advocates for clean air. I wonder if you can comment uh, about a subject that I didn't hear a lot about in your talk, and that's health, individual health, public health, and the state of that part of a, that potential coalition. Yeah, I mean, so what you have, a, a, even in, in New York City, some of the strongest supporters for, for these changes are, are from the Department of, of Health. Because what, what, you're, what you're actually seeing is that when people le leading these um, automobile-dominated life, lifestyles, you, you actually don't get enough exercise if you're just driving around all the day. And, and it's a problem. You now have um, epidemic levels of childhood obesity, uh, obesity in general, and what what doctors are realizing is that the best way to make people healthy is to make it easy for them to live an active lifestyle. So if people just incorporate exercise into their normal daily life, which is just walking and cycling around, that, that, that has enormous consequences for their health. And, and you actually are seeing the public health community being some of the strongest advocates for, for this change in New York and, and around the country. I would, I would add to that that, you know, it's not just the public health community. You're looking at insurers who realize that in order for them to be able to successfully bid for contracts to employers, to be able to provide benefits to their, uh, to their employees, they need to be able to incorporate uh, some sort of active, uh, uh, active living component to uh, their daily lives. I, I personally feel that one of the, the, the biggest... Uh, uh, game changers that we have in terms of having uh, more walkable neighborhoods and changing the development patterns is our pedometers uh, and the fact that people are become, becoming accustomed to needing to walk 
you know, 5,000 uh, uh, steps per day in order to meet certain goals. And a number of folks are doing that within suburban communities by parking further away from storefronts. Uh, so we can just take that kind of a, of a mindset and shift that toward getting people to become accustomed to um, tr uh, either traveling to or living within uh, walkable, bikeable communities. Uh, that's a part of the, a culture change that's uh, beginning to take place. Uh, Jennifer, we, we have a, a new complete streets ordinance in the city of Cleveland. How good is it and what results are we seeing from that? Well, I think what at this point, since it's still relatively new, we're seeing a lot of ideas, a lot of discussion. We have, and I mean, one great example was um, the experiment two weeks ago at Prospect and turning that into a multimodal bike lane um, that was done by the um, CUDC in town. That's uh, the uh, Kent, State Kent State University Ur Cleveland Urban, Urban Design, Design Collaborative. How's that for a mouthful? They do great work, uh, <laughs> great nonprofit uh, design work here. Right. So I see there's a lot of discussions that are coming out, which is great because the key thing, and I think one of the things that Mark said that I, I wrote down was that we need to create a uh, sense of policy expectations. And that's just not necessarily from the government, but from everyone who's here outside, we need to kind of demand policy changes. So right now we've got complete streets. We don't want it to just go away or have it be um, held in City Hall, but it's enough to be knowledgeable about what it really means. I think it's a pretty good standard, but we've got to make sure, we've got to make sure that we stay on the city to implement. That's how do, the, how do the people in the room educate themselves about what's in this ordinance? Where, where can they find it? Uh, you know, is it, is it easily accessible on, on the city's website? I think it's accessible on the website. There are other avenues to get to that website, whether it's blogging, whether it's urban design groups doing these type of experiments, which brings that information out. It could be just general businesses talking about complete streets, on their websites, private businesses. Those are the type of things, again, to look at how this is beneficial. You know, one other idea in talking about the health initiative is a cross-pollination, whether it is our local food movement, which is very strong, and to have that tie into transportation, to start getting that message, the same message coming in. You know, that, that's health. a very powerful idea. It reminds me of what happened with the arts community in, in Cleveland, which uh, joined with other groups to uh, promote community health and, and uh, social services. And then when it came time for the, uh, the vote on the cigarette tax to fund the arts here, uh, that, was, that was approved. And, and now we're, uh, we have some of the uh, largest uh, public arts funding uh, for, the, for Cuyahoga County uh, um, in comparison to other counties and states in the, in the country. We're, we've done amazing things in the arts. Uh, could this be uh, a similar kind of cause? Absolutely. I think Chris talked about Bike Cleveland, which is a relatively new, I suppose, initiative by the biking community. You guys probably know all about it. Um, that one of the key objectives is to create a sense of place. And that's something that doesn't, it's not just a bike issue. It's preservation issues. It's architectural. It's many different ways. So these different organizations that we have out there that are kind of loosely described as civic can pull together on issues that they hold dear to themselves and make that message much more stronger to the public. So I'm, I'm imagining an advocacy group going to Toby Cosgrove at the Cleveland Clinic and saying, you know, we can help you avoid having to build your next parking garage. I would, right? I hope. Okay. <laughs> uh, Chris, how, how bikeable is Cleveland? Um, in, you know, in comparison to European cities, certainly not so much, but uh, I live in, uh, in Tremont. I uh, bike uh, on a uh, hopefully daily basis, depending on uh, what I have uh, going on downtown. It is fairly bikeable if you are experienced enough. Uh, the challenge that we have is to be able to make it more bikeable for uh, that whole range from 8 to 80. Uh, if you're a uh, young child, uh, unless you're staying within your street or on the sidewalks, it's not very bikeable. If you're elderly, uh, it's not bikeable either. Uh, so we can take advantage of a lot of the pavement width that we have already and uh, use uh, some of the existing regulations, create uh, bike tracks or bike lanes, and then move the city toward uh, adopting new regulations and new standards that make it easier to put in these facilities. Yeah. Yeah, Jason. Uh, Steve, if I could just add to that, I think a couple of the points that Mark made were really powerful that 
to make a city more bikeable in many cases, especially cities in Northeast Ohio where we do have excess highway capacity, you're not talking about spending tens of millions of dollars. Um, in a lot of cases, it is it's paint in some cases, restriping roads. Um, and I think it's just now, I mean, speaking as someone who works for a public sector transportation planning and funding agency, I think it's just now in this region that we're starting to think about cycling as an actual viable mode of transportation. Speaking for our region, at least in Summit County, most of our federal funding for bike uh, infrastructure has gone into the towpath trail. That's a great facility, uh, but it is primarily a recreational facility. It can be used for commuting, but um, what we're doing at our agency now is we're actively talking about how you do on road uh, cycling. We build a website called switchinggears.org, which is a social network for cyclists. And we're going to hold a public meeting uh, next week at a park on the west side of Akron where we're actually going to sit down with cyclists, talk a little bit. We're going to go for an eight mile ride and, and ride these streets. We're going to ride West Market Street, we're going to ride Exchange Street, and we're going to see, I think, in many cases, how unfriendly it is to bike. And we're calling it Bike and Brainstorm. And we're going to go back to the park and we're going to sit down and uh, i think it's going to be educational both for us as transportation uh, professionals as well as the people from the public and if people want to uh, participate in that where, where do they go for it's going to be uh may 17th six o'clock at hardesty park and i know jerry you live close to there so i expect <laughs> to see you there um but it, it's it, seriously anybody here who's interested in coming down we, we'd love to have you okay we have a question Akron. Um, outside of our downtown areas in most of our neighborhoods and in our smaller communities, we require developers to provide uh, free off-street parking. Mm -hmm. And we all have also come to expect free off-street parking. And I was wondering if you might comment upon the impact on our urban form and on our livable streets by the requirement that we have developed over the years to provide this free source of parking and storage for this transportation option. So, I mean, again, I think those sorts of requirements do an enormous amount of harm. Um, I mean, you have situations in a lot of places where developers are forced to build parking that they wouldn't rationally build themselves just because of requirements. And also, I mean, because of just the spatial needs and the, and the, the way you have to set it up, it, it almost prohibits having transit-oriented development and things like that. So um, I, I, there, I think those regulations need, need a lot of reform. Well, this is what James Howard Kunstler called the national automobile slum in his, uh, one of his books, right? Yeah. Many, many of those regulations are based on uh, trying to account, I believe, for uh, the tenth busiest hour of the year and so that's what the, uh, the the parking lots are actually sized for and I think that it's like this uh, uh, the the uh, two o'clock on on a, the Friday after Thanksgiving that's what the, the parking lots are designed for I think it would be helpful um, to not just encourage uh, businesses uh, and uh, to work with one another on, on just basic things like parking sharing but to actually put together a, uh, a model, a legal model that actually helps uh, uh, businesses to work with say churches to identify how it is that they could not just share the parking with one another but to actually set contracts uh, and maintenance agreements that, that make sense for uh, shared parking to take place so that we can take more of that off of off the road in addition to biking, pedestrian and transit uh, oriented design and uh, 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 investments. You look at a lot of cities now are looking more towards uh, form-based zoning codes versus land use. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Oh. Okay, what is a form-based <laughs> zoning code? Just, I was going to explain okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Steve. A form-based, well, let's go with land use, which is what we have now, which is this area is zoned for business versus another area that's zoned residential and another area that's zoned uh, industrial. And that's how we've done it for the past, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years. 
Um, and, and separation of land uses promotes automobile usage and right. trips because you have to go to so many places to accomplish your daily business. Exactly. And as things have sort of changed and mashed up a little bit, you'll have conditional, you'll have some mixed uses along those lines. But basically, land use codes are based on unprecedented growth. I mean, cities in the mid, you know, the mid uh, 50s, so mid centuries, were expected just to keep on growing. So you put these groups of people here and these groups of people there, and then you keep these people over here. So, and everyone's happy because they're separated and they don't have to really deal with each other's issues. Um, that is kind of not working now because we have areas that have, you know, their specific problems and trying to bridge that gap and create sort of a, the idea of a cohesive city, how it used to be, how we would like to see it now, is really difficult with that type of code. Again, with, and also with the problem of growth not being as uh, optimistic as it, we were originally thinking about it. So form-based is more looking at sort of the aspirations of what we want in a city. Um, do we want it to be, you know, to be a higher density? Do we want to really combat sprawl in, in the case? That's really how form-based kind of came about, one of their main issues. So you're looking at some cities who have adopted a form-based code. Uh, Nashville is a good example. They adopted their new code in 2010, and they've taken out parking requirements completely. So, so form-based form code would, would tell you your building is going to come up to the sidewalk and frame a public space. You're not going to set back and have parking in front of the front door of your business. Right, and you look at some things like what is on the first floor, what as you're experiencing the city, there would be some requirements in terms of, um, you know, what do you want to see, what do you want to experience as a pedestrian or as a bicyclist. So instead of kind of creating certain, we need one space per 100 people going into a store or to a business, you look at, well, what do we want that street to reflect? How do we want that street to be vibrant? You know, sometimes height controls come into the, the, the mix, um, the, but it's, it's a little bit more aspirational, I think, than sort of directing different colors on a, a land use zoning map. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Hi, I'm Kevin Leeson, um, and I suspect with this audience you're mostly uh, preaching to the choir already, and I'm just wondering how you get these messages out to people who have spent their entire lives in an auto-dominated society and may not realize that there are other options. Well, that's what Mark, Mark is, I think Mark is doing that by uh, founding Streets Blog, right? I mean, that's one yeah, of the I ways. Mean, so, again, I, I, would, I wish I could reach everybody very easily. Um, what, I, what I have come to the realization is that I think you almost have to do it in concentric circles. So there's the, you know, kind of the, the core at first who have to get these, because these are new ideas. And then, at least in New York, one of the things we've seen is you get the people interested in policy, you then change the policy, which then changes things on the street, which then confronts other people with a different reality that they have to then examine themselves. And that has created a, a wider debate in the media and things like that. So in New York, I think because a lot of things we're talking about are happening in the city, you have the wider media engaged about talking about specific projects, and that tends to engage a, a lot of people. And, and I think, you know, and also as people travel around, they see these things happening in other cities, and that, that's getting them. But it, it's definitely hard because, you know, most people don't think about most things. Jason, you want to I think Mark, I think Mark hit on it with the concentric circles that it's, uh, it's something that I think it takes patience and perseverance to advocate for. It's something I think that we have to do incrementally, but with an eye on, tr like, with transformative change being the end result, not just incrementalism for the sake of, well, that's the best we can get. Um, and I think, like, Mark's presentation is just so powerful because, and if you read James Howard Kunstler, <laughs> like you referred to, Steve, although he's a little intense for, and depressing for a lot of people, <laughs> but, um, you, you realize that we, it, it's almost like the matrix. You know, we are so programmed for the way that we view society or view, you know, it's just a giving in a shopping center, you're gonna have a gigantic parking lot with two thirds of the spaces empty other than Christmas Eve and people just accept it. And I don't, and I think that's where we have to be, I think gentle with people in a way that we don't demonize everyone for decisions 
that a lot of us just make because that's the status quo and that's what, what we're used to. But I think you can also, if you take the opposite extreme, be so wishy-washy and accommodating that you'll never have any, any change. So I think it's a delicate balance. Well, there, there's two things we were talking about here. One, one is concentric circles, but also feedback loops. The feedback loop of you make a change, then people see it, and uh, then that creates a whole, a whole new, a whole new dy dynamic. Uh, Chris, let's just go to the uh, back corner there because we have a, a questioner. Hi, um, my name's Rob Heinen, and you, I just had a question. You didn't go over much in your presentation about open plans and kind of the role of technology in facing these problems and kind of also if you see a way that the city can encourage local like startup and technology growth to help solve some of the problems facing the city, if you could comment on that. Okay, sure. So open plans is my not-for-profit. Um, and two-thirds of the people who work for it are software developers. And, and the, the bulk of what we do is software development. So we, I mean, so the most easily accessible for people is we have Streets Blog and streetsblog.org, streetfilms.org, um, which are media sites related to this. But we're also doing, we're building open source community participation, transportation, land use planning tools, which um, are in their early phases. So some of the things that we've done that have been rolled out, in, in New York City, we're working with New York City DOT. Um, we have a information portal which just is allowing DOT to communicate better what they're doing in certain neighborhoods. Um, we, New York City is, um, is just in the process of rolling out, out bike share. And what we've done is we built a website that allows people to suggest where they want to see bike share stations. And that information is then being incorporated into the planning process in order to, um, to you know, help the city decide where to put bike share stations. Um, but that, that's really just kind of the first step. These are, you know, these are kind of the very first projects. We have, we have a much longer term vision of having a comprehensive suite of online tools to allow community decision making input in the planning process and also to, to um, allow you know, for better analysis of, of transportation scenarios and, and do land use planning for, for professionals so they have tools to, to allow them to do a, a, a better job in that. And it, it's, I mean, I could go on. It, that, that's a whole other like hour talk in a different direction, but I think that's probably a, a, a brief summary. I'm happy to talk more afterwards if, you, if you're interested. Okay, one more in the back. I wanted to take two seconds. Oh, tell to, us your name, please. Oh, Mary Dunbar. Thank um, you. I wanted to take two seconds to invite Stephen Litt to the uh, architectural tour of the historic districts in Cleveland Heights on Saturday at 10 o'clock, okay. uh, where we'll talk about what the features, <laughs> architectural features are, as so that people can appreciate them as they ride by on their bicycles. Okay. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to talk for a second about the reality that we have such an ugly political mood in this country. Things are so divided right now. And apropos of this, this conversation that we're having today, uh, I read a column recently by George Will, uh, who writes for uh, Newsweek magazine. And uh, Mark, to your point about the importance of promoting transit use as a way to humanize our, our cities and to make uh, more compact uh, and, and attractive uh, neighborhoods in which we can live, he believes it's all part of a communist plot to take us to take our our, our automobiles and and uh, gas pumps away from us. And so he actually concluded this column by saying, uh, in, instead of uh, the rallying cry of the left today, uh, instead of it being workers of the world unite, the rallying cry is all aboard. What do you? I mean, how do you feel about things like that? That when you see things like that in, in the media today. Oh well, yeah. It's certainly upsetting. Um, I think, to you know, to some extent, at least we are making enough of a dent that people feel that they have to respond, which is which is which is something. Um, but I also think that it is it's a challenge for for us in, in the movement to do a good job articulating the value of transit because and and, and of all of the these things that we're doing here. Because I think in Europe, if you walk up to a person on the street and ask them about you know, land use planning or transportation hierarchies or, or things like that, they understand it 
in a, in a way that most Americans don't. And if you're going to have the, the political support for this, you need to have understanding. And it's a little complicated understanding you know, why is a city supposed to support transit. And, and the, you know, it gets into all of these complicated issues. And I think we need to do a good job of of sort of connecting this in a way. But when people start demonizing you as communists, that, I mean, it's nice that they don't have good rational arguments against this. And, and you're starting to really see that, um, you know, and, but I mean, honestly, I mean, the, the auto industry and the oil industry are very, very powerful. And they have managed to, to really control a lot of the political process. If you look at the countries in the world that are best at this stuff, um, you know, Holland and, and Denmark and, and, and Switzerland, these are places that don't have domestic auto industries or oil industries. And so like that really does make a, make a difference. And so it, it, it's a real challenge. Yes, Jason. I think also we need, we need a bipartisan reality check in Washington. Um, the everybody, Washington tries to be all things to all people with transportation. The Congress tries to pretend like we can spend lots of money on roads, lots of money on transit, lots of money on uh, air travel, lots of money on high-speed rail. News is we don't have lots of money. And we are, the transfer, the Highway Trust Fund has gone broke twice now. We're well, the, the tax hasn't been increased since, uh, since 1993. 1993. We're paying the exact same amount since 1993. Right, so we have to have a realistic adult conversation in this country about what kind of transportation system we want to have, and then we have to go out and fund it. And I would argue we need something like the 1956 Interstate Highway Act that made, as Mark alluded to, the conscious decision to build, uh, build what they were called then superhighways. Um, I think our, our conversation on high-speed rail, and probably one reason George Will had all aboard as his last kind of jab at uh, that type of transportation plan is, I think we are very re unrealistic on high-speed rail. If you look, I actually wrote a letter to President Obama and then Governor Strickland, and if they ever show up here at the City Club, maybe you guys can ask them about that. But um, the high-speed rail system, it's not planned like the interstate highway system. I think if we're going to do high-speed rail, we need to connect every urban area over 50,000 people in this country together, and then we have to summon the political will to build it and fund it. And if we're not going to do that, then I think we're fooling ourselves and it's ever going to be competitive. Okay, Chris wanted to add Yeah, something. you know, information is not going to, by itself, is not going to change the mind of somebody who, who vehemently opposes uh, what you want. It's it, Much of it, I think, is based off of finding out what, what it is that they value, probably in the case, I mean, as irresponsible as what George Will said, uh, underlying that is, is this value of, of individuality and mobility. So how is it that we make the case that, that making bikeable, walkable, more transit-friendly environments actually contributes? Enhances your personal liberty. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, one more question, and then, then we're going to conclude. Chris Pierce, uh, Mark, what's happened in New York City is very impressive to a lot of us, and we're looking to New York as a model. But I'm curious, as somebody who's on the inside there, uh, how strong you think that is, or how fragile you think it is, or susceptible to change in administration? That you know, is is New York City getting on board, or or you know, just sort of what's the state there? Yeah, well, there's a lot of us who are working to solidify um, the political support. So certainly, um, any change stirs up controversy. And when you start taking away road space from cars, you, I mean, there, there has been some very vocal criticism of these pol policies. One of the great things about Mayor Bloomberg is that he really just does the right thing. And he's not a traditional politician. And, and if he thinks the policy is good, he's just going to go with it. He's been very supportive of Jeanette Sada Khan. Um, so there is, there's, we don't know what the future brings. Most of the, the potential mayoral candidates have been sort of quiet to, uh, on this topic. I think a lot of them are sort of trying to just avoid controversy and, and, and um, but there, there has actually been the, the bicycle advocacy group in New York City, Transportation Alternatives, actually commissioned a poll where they went, even, and they basically found across the city um, about two-thirds of the people support bike lanes, even in the most car-centric neighborhoods and, uh, and among p 
people who aren't cyclists and things like that. So there, there seems to be pretty good uh, political, you know, kind of broad-based popular support. And as they build more good cycle infrastructure, you get more people cycling. I think bike share is going to get a lot more people out there. And so there really is this hope that that people see that this is something that um, you know is is good for them, and it's not just you know planning for some guy in spandex or something like that. Um, and I think that you you also have. A lot of people across the city have gotten a lot more educated about this. They realize what's possible. So I think we're, it, it's certainly, uh, I'm confident this is a long-term thing that we are going to continue to build out the, the cycling infrastructure, that cycling mode share is going to go up, that, you know, bus rapid transit's going to come, all those things. That's not to say that, you know, with a horrible regressive mayor, things couldn't slow radically for, you know, four or eight years, but we're fighting hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, well, I want to thank the panel for a really fantastic discussion, and I'm going to hand this over to Angie for closing remarks. Thank you all very much for coming today. Great discussion. Angie. I'm going to be really quick. I just wanted to get in a quick thanks to our sponsors, Bike Cleveland and the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. I want to thank Carrie Miller from the City Club, Barb Clint with um, Bike Cleveland, who's been really helpful in putting this together. And I wanted to invite you all. Bike Cleveland's having a social event in, that begins in one hour at Martin Garden Brewery. And we're going to be filming street films that we specifically selected because we think they're relevant to what's going on here in Cleveland. So thanks so much. I won't hold you guys up any longer. Oh, I got I to gotta ring the bell. I'm getting a signal. Thank <laughs> you.